Chip. Welcome to the show. Oh man, honor. I'm, I'm excited to be here. You know what? I, uh, I, think, I think a good place to start would be to, to take you back to Halloween in 1986. You were, you were a 26-year-old chip, and you decided that you wanted to buy something called the, the Caravan Motor Lodge. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yes. Everybody thought I was an idiot. <laughs> but you knew you weren't. It was a bad hotel in a bad neighborhood. Can you sort of maybe walk me through how yeah. you went from a hotel that hookers were hanging out in <laughs> to bringing in Faye Dunaway and David Bowie, and John Kennedy. And for those that are old enough, like me and you to remember Linda Ronstadt. Um, <laughs> and for those that are younger, maybe uh, Anthony Kiedis of the Red Hot Chili Peppers or Sinead O'Connor or or the incomparable Keanu Reeves. How did you go from hookers to Keanu Reeves? <laughs> well, you know what? That 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 I'm not going. That was that could have gone in many different directions, and I'm not going to go there. Um, what I what I am going to say, in, interestingly enough, River Phoenix and Keanu Reeves were there, and they actually played, I think, a couple hustlers in a movie called Private Idaho a long time ago, and they were at the hotel together. But long story short, is uh, you know it was a pay by the hour motel, um, so you you pay you didn't pay for the night, you paid for the hour, and. But it was in bankruptcy at the point I was buying it. I was a commercial real estate developer who wanted something more creative in my life. I was, as, as you said, quite young. And I decided I wanted to jump on the surfboard uh, for this big wave that was coming, which was called Boutique Hotels. And so that first hotel, I renamed the Phoenix, like the mythological bird rising from its own ashes. And we specifically went after a, a clientele that a lot of a lot of hotels don't want, which is bands, music, musical groups, and um, we hit it. You know, I, we just became a big big success. My company Joie de Vivre, uh, which means Joy of Life in French, went on to create fifty two boutique hotels during the twenty four years that I was uh, the CEO. So when I watch um, Saturday, no, when I watch. Um, Studio, what was the, uh, yes, I guess it was called Studio 54, the movie. When yes. I watched that movie and I think about that sort of like excess time, you know, the, the you know, d doing, uh, doing coke off of, uh, off, off of hooker, <laughs> hooker's asses, that period, you remember that, right? <laughs> like that world, when I think about that, and then I think about how, um, you know, Ian Schrager winds up getting locked up with his buddy, um, you know, for, for stuff and cash in the ceiling, right? Like, yeah. Just to paint the picture. That's that time. And then he sort of like reemerges out into the world and he says, boutique hotels. Was that, was that around the time that you were also doing it? Were you before him, after him? Give me that time frame. So, yeah. So to, to, to understand, it's basically exactly 40 years ago. Uh, Ian Schrager was the first person in the United States to say, why is it that hotels are boring? Why can't you um, stay in a place that is aspirational? Uh, what, what, I, what I call you are where you sleep, not you are what you eat. Maybe it's you are who you sleep with. <laughs> <laughs> Based upon the direction this interview is going, like who knows? Or, or listen, you are what you eat too. That's a whole other conversation. Oh my God, you're we're, going listen. there. We're going to do um, it. We, we, uh, we need a little fun during this pandemic, don't we? <laughs> I do like this, actually. Um, so uh, so uh, he did. He was the first. And then Bill Kimpton was second. Or it was either actually one or the other. Bill Kimpton, Ian Schrager, one was first, the other was second. I was about a year or two after the two of them. And so what I could see is they, while they hadn't really created a, an exceptionally successful boutique hotel yet, they had started creating these smaller personalized design oriented hotels that had a pretty good restaurant or bar in them. And so I, you know, at 26, I was like, Hey, I want to do that myself. So that's, how, that's what my timing. All right. So that the boutique, the boutique uh, hotel company that you built, uh, Joie de Vivre, did I do that right? You did. Yeah. Awesome. Became one of the most uh, successful boutique hotels in history where you were creating managing, I think at one point, 50 hotels. But 
you also had your share of setbacks during Mm. that time. Can you tell me maybe what business lessons you learned post 9-11 and maybe even talk about your heart issue and how that sort of impacted your life a few years after that moving forward? Yeah, no. So, um, you know, it's funny. I I think that you can look at your work as one, there's one of three relationships you can have with it. It's, It's either a job, a career or a calling. I like to think of it in the pyramid. So jobs at the base, careers in the middle, callings at the top. Because it's at the top, that basically means on a pyramid. It means that, frankly, not, <clears throat> not everybody ever finds their calling. Well, I found my calling by starting this boutique hotel company and growing it. I loved it until I hated it. It, 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 went, from, it went from calling to job. It, it just it went, it sort of went over a career. And, and what happened for me along that time was the dot-com bus, 9-11, uh, all of our hotels were in the San Francisco Bay Area. We survived it pretty well, and we actually we got better as a result of it. But it was a tough period. Um, and then we grew a lot in about 2005 to 2008, and we were going through our fastest growth ever. And I had written a couple books, and they'd been successful, and I liked the writing, and I liked the speaking. And so I wasn't sure I wanted to do this CEO thing anymore. I'd been doing it for 22 years And then the Great Recession came along. And 2008 was an awful year for me, 2008 and 2009. But 2008 in particular, it was a year where I lost a few friends to suicide going into the recession, including a great friend of mine named Chip, you know, who has the same name I have. Um, I didn't want to be running this company anymore. And yet, as you go into a great recession of of that notable kind of downturn, um, I couldn't walk away from this company. You know, I was like the mini, like tiny version of Richard Branson to Virgin was chipped to, to uh, Joie de Vivre. In fact, Richard uh, wrote the foreword of my first book called The Rebel Rules. So I was stuck and I had handcuffs on and I was in a relationship that was going badly. I had a foster son who was an adult who was in trouble. And then I went to play baseball um, <laughs> at Gavin Newsom, who was the mayor of San Francisco at the time, now is the governor of California, um, at, at AT&T Ballpark, which is now called Oracle Park. It's where the San Francisco Giants play. And I hit a ball, which you can do. If you're, if you're the mayor of the San Francisco, you can throw your bachelor party in a empty stadium and have 18 of your friends come over. Listen, and- you, can, you can go to French Laundry and not wear a mask too. You can do whatever the hell you, you, can, do whatever the hell you want. You, you can do that and, maybe, <laughs> and, and, and then maybe get recalled. Um, so <laughs> long story short is I, I broke my ankle uh, playing baseball, but I didn't realize I got a, a cut on my leg. I ended up having a bacterial infection in my leg uh, as well. Um, they put me on an antibiotic. And when I was giving a speech in St. Louis, you know, a couple of weeks later, um, I should have been at home, you know, but I was on crutches, on antibiotics. And after my speech, while I was signing books, I, I went unconscious. And five minutes later, I went flatline. Luckily, the paramedics were there. They shocked me back to life. But I went flatline again eight more times in the next 90 minutes. So that was uh, my wake up call, <laughs> to use an interesting term for a hotelier. That was the wake up call for the hotelier to realize that I didn't necessarily want to be doing this anymore. And if I'm going to die, I want to do, die doing something that I, I, I want to be doing. And so that's, I spent the next two years working hard, playing hard, mostly working hard, trying to figure out how do I get myself out of this, what felt like a prison. And, um, and I did. You know, I sold my company two years later. I sold it for so much less than it was worth. But I was able to sell it and get out of it and get out of this role after 24 years of being CEO so I could see what was going to happen next. And, and uh, that was 2010 when I sold it. All right. So I want to dig into a few things. Uh, the people who are listening to this show um, are passionate entrepreneurs that, uh, quite frankly, probably work more than they should, um, mm-hmm. know that they need to play more, which is all these pictures you see behind you. I, I take them on trips around the world, bucket list experiences, um, because it's important for them to play. I recognize that. And so I want to dig into a few things there. The first one is you talked about having a calling. How do you know if mm. what you have is a calling? Is it yeah. one of those things that's like, you know, the Supreme Court judge, 
you know, they were asking <laughs> him to, to describe pornography. And he's like, I know it when I see it. Do you know right. what I mean? Is it like that kind of thing? Yeah. Potter Stewart, the famous, yeah. famous Supreme Court judge said that, you know, here's, <clears throat> it's not what you know when you see it, you know it when you feel it. So, you know, it when you feel it, if you have a calling, it's coming from something inside of you and it is, it is fueling you versus workaholism. Workaholism is a form of an, addic an addiction. You often are doing it compulsively in some cases because you're distracting yourself from something else or because you're actually trying to prove yourself to someone else. And so it's, Workaholism, workaholism often is a reaction to how you are interacting with the world. A calling is something that is just coming through you. And so mm -hmm. there's, a, I mean, that sounds very abstract, but you, anybody who has been in, I have been both. I have been, I've lived a calling. I've also been a workaholic. When I am a workaholic, I know that being, dis, the process of distracting myself and being able to do that is allowing me to forget about something over there that I don't want to look at. Um, or um, when someone actually uh, forces me to stop working, I get a little angry. I get a little upset. Why? Whereas if I, because in some ways you're forcing me out of this little private room I've gone to and I'm having to deal with maybe something I didn't want to deal with. Whereas if you have a calling, if you interrupt me in the middle of it, I'm probably not going to get into a bad mood. I'm just saying, hey, I'm just so much. I'm totally in the flow right now. I've lost track of time. Um, give me five more minutes and then I'll come out. Because frankly, it's just a matter of actually unleashing yourself from the joy that you're having, as opposed to uh, when you're a workaholic, it, you're doing it because it's the way you distract yourself. Just like an alcoholic or a sexaholic or anybody who has a bit of an addiction is often doing it because it's building self-esteem or it's distracting them from something that they don't want to look at. Was there something in the name that was foreshadowing? Was there something in the name of Joie de Vivre that was sort yeah. of foreshadowing um, how you sort of like pulled that out so early on in your life, what you were yeah. after? You're so smart. <laughs> <laughs> That's you. why you have so many people listening to you. Yeah. <laughs> Joie de Vivre is a terrible name for a company. People don't know how to spell it, how to, how to say it. Um, they don't know even know what it necessarily means. But how many companies in the world have a mission statement that is also the name of the company? Our mission statement was to create opportunities to celebrate the joy of life. And we really felt that that was most important for our employees and our customers, not just our customers alone. So, the culture we created was a culture based upon creating joy. So going through a period as I was going through in 2008 through 2010, when, and I was, I had my last book I'd written prior to that was called Peak, How Great Companies Get Their Mojo from Maslow, Abraham Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. So here I am, the guy who called his company Joie de Vivre, all about joy, who wrote a book that became a bestseller about self-actualization in the workplace so feeling like you can be all you can be. And I hated what I was doing. <laughs> that was a bad fit because in some ways, I, that name of the company was the reminder for me of what I was supposed to be feeling as well. Not just what my employees and my customers were feeling. And when the joy was gone, what I could go back to is look at, why did I start this company in the first place? And I, I was very clear on that. I could go back to my journals from that time. And it was because I was looking for creativity and freedom. And in 2008, with 3,500 employees and a ton of debt and business falling off, off the cliff because of uh, the recession um, and opening 15 ho new hotels in 21 months, which is a lot, um, I, I, would, I just realized that I wasn't feeling much joy. Mm, interesting. Okay. So you grew up with, um, with money. Your parents were wealthy people, Yeah. No, they're nope. middle class. I, middle I, class I just, people. Middle class. I went, I went to inner city high school called okay. Long Beach, Long Beach Poly High School. So, you know, Snoop Dogg's high school. So <laughs> that, wow. definitely, not, definitely not wealthy. I mean, I would say if, you know, they're middle class, we were middle class to maybe slightly a higher than middle class, but definitely okay. not, not, not wealthy. Okay. What I was driving at is a lot of, um, 
a lot of listeners to the show are driving hard for money. Like they want that pile of cash. They're looking mm -hmm. not only for the income, they want the exit. They want that big pile. So you'd mentioned that you exited. It wasn't the number that you thought right. perhaps it was worth, but I'm sure it was something. So yeah. when you think about that time uh, in, I think it was 2010, where you decided mm -hmm. that, you know, I'm, se I'm selling this business. Yep. What was that period like for you after you got the check and you were no longer directly tied, in, you know, in the same capacity that you were? Well, yeah, let me let me give you some a few other details. So I was selling the management company and the brand, um, which which is the each of these 50 hotels, 52 hotels was managed and branded with Joie de Vivre, although each one had its own name. Long story short is I still owned 20 of the hotels with partners. I was a minority owner in all 20 of those deals, actually just 22 of the deals. I was the, a minority partner. Um, but when I sold the company, I didn't sell my real estate. So in essence, I sold the company to a guy named John Pritzker, whose father started Hyatt, and Joan Aviv is now a Hyatt brand. And so now John's company, my old company, is managing hotels that I still own. So I still own the real estate. So here's what I was able to do. I was able to take myself out of the role of day-to-day -day operations and having people screaming at me, you know, why isn't our hotel doing better numbers and, and the market's falling apart? And it's like, okay, there's lots of good reasons for that. So, but I, but I have that I, in, in 2010, when I sold in June, 2010, I was able to ride the upside of the real estate moving forward. So what that did is it allowed me to have space back in my life and less stress. Um, but it, and I didn't, and yes. And did I have regret about what I sold that company for? Yes, I did. But I also had the upside um, as the real estate market started to improve. And that upside ended up being quite substantial. But to your, to your question, I think so many of us, so I was still sort of involved in the business in certain ways. Um, but for so many of us, when we sell a company, we are not emotionally prepared for what it's going to feel like because our identity has been defined by that business card. And in my case, by lots of press um, and lots of notoriety as you know, a, a very high profile boutique hotelier in the US, even though all of our hotels are in California. Um, so what I will just say is I had two years to prepare for that because I had that flatline experience and the flatline experience told me like, damn, I don't want to die this way. I don't, I was 47 years old at the time when I had the flatline experience. I don't want to die, um, in this job. And so I felt like the get, get out of jail free card when I got unleashed from that. But what I had to do is say, okay, who am I now? You know, who, if I'm no longer, I'm the, I am the former founder and I, I'm the founder and former CEO of Joie de Vivre, but who am I going to be next? There's a great uh, line in the movie, The Intern with Robert De Niro and Anne Hathaway, where De Niro says, musicians don't retire. They quit when there's no more music left inside of them. Mm. So I knew I, at age 50, at the point where I'd sold, I had music inside of me. I just wasn't sure who to share it with. Mm. If you had not had the flatline experience, where would your life be today? Oh my God. Uh, you know, it's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm scared to imagine it. I, we pro my company would have survived. Joie de Vivre would have survived. Um, I don't know whether I, I, I don't know about my emotional state of, on the other side of that survival. Uh, I might still be operating that damn business. Thank God during the, the, the pandemic, I'm not running a, a hotel company because that's a terrible business to be in today. Um, it would never have given me the space to have something emerge as what, as what happened when the three founders of Airbnb approached me. What I did in, in between, between the time I sold the business and, and the time I started helping the founders of Airbnb with their little te tech startup is I did two primary things. I wrote another book called Emotional Equations. It's my fourth book at that point. And I 
decided I wanted to create the, on the fun side, the play side. I was always fascinated by festivals. I was one of the founding board members of the uh, Burning Man nonprofit that owns the owns Burning Man. Um, I was I would go around to festivals around the world, and so I decided to create a website. I take my passion and ter- and and apply and apply it as a purpose uh, to start as an entrepreneur as a website called Fest Three Hundred, which which was an annual list of the three hundred best festivals in the world. And so for uh, one year, I went to 36 festivals in 16 countries of all kinds, not just music or, you know, um, transformational festivals, but religious pilgrimages and film festivals and cultural festivals, et cetera. And that was just a blast. Um, and, and yet the business, <laughs> the business, the business n- n- had got a great following, but never could figure out how to monetize. Um, and it was right around that time that I got the call from Brian Chesky. Um, the young uh, CEO and co-founder of Airbnb. All right, we're going to dig into that. I want to ask you one more question on the flat line uh, because I think it's important here because I don't want people to have to learn this lesson the way mm. you had to learn mm. this lesson. Do you, um, from, a, from a sort of like woo-woo spiritual standpoint, do you believe that, that this was, that this happens um, because there was no other way that it was going to get your attention. So spiritually, you had to get the message this way. And it, do you think that there were some whispers before there were b- before there was this frying pan that hit you in the head? Yeah. Um, so it, it did feel a bit like a divine intervention. I will I'll acknowledge that, and I still feel that. Um, the whispers were there. I was in YPO. And with my YPO forum for the year or two prior, they heard me talk quite confidentially that I'd been dreaming of cancer and car crashes. Mm. And the intention was not to die. The intention was to have an excuse for why I could take a, a break and maybe move away from this company that I didn't want to be doing anymore. So the whispers were there, no doubt. And so when it actually happened, my YPO forum who of course, you know, were sworn to confidentiality and I hadn't talked about car- cancer or car crashes with other people. They were so much, you know, in, on, on my team, you know, trying to say, hey, what's going on? You know, tell us what's going on because, you know, I, I really, they were some of the first people I reached out to, all, most of whom were other entrepreneurs or senior executives or CEOs of companies. Um, so what they, what they did is they helped cheer me along and saying, you know what, you, you really do need to sell this company. It's the worst time to do that. Um, <clears throat> but I can say that, you know, your body it keeps score. And for Good me, my, yeah, my body was keeping score of the fact that I had stress. You know, none of this, it was an allergic reaction to an antibiotic, but my body was absolutely keeping score about where I was in my life. And probably more emotionally and spiritually than even physically um, because I, I was physically in good shape. Um, so yeah, sometimes, sometimes you just have to listen to your body. How do you now listen when you get those whispers? Are they louder now where you act on them or do you still find yourself tripping up and just tunnel vision? Yeah, no, I am um, much more cognizant of them uh, today. And um uh, I, I, I have had to listen to my body twice, and, I, and maybe when we continue on with our conversation here, I'll tell you the two other times there, there's been a warning sign, and I heeded these warning signs um, as opposed to, to sort of like just putting on the blinders. All right. I want to talk about uh, Damien. Who is mm-hmm. Damien, and why was he so significant in your life? Yeah. So, so Damien, so I, I grew up um, in Long Beach, California. I went to junior high school and high school in the inner city. Um, I was a minority as a white person, as a white guy. Um, and I loved it, just loved it. So I was fascinated by, um, I was basically culturally curious for uh, uh, other, other races and ethnicities, partly because of what I grew up with. Um, and then I went to Stanford, I went to Stanford Business School and played water polo there, was in a fraternity sort of wasn't, didn't see that culturally curious part of me. You were very white. I, I was very white. <laughs> very just, white. Like, just like you. Um, just so. like me. Very <laughs> well. I get it. I get yeah. it. And, and so, I, I, you know, then I, my first hotel that I create at age 26 
is in the inner city of San Francisco in the Tenderloin. And so at age 28, I started volunteering for a local YMCA youth program, mentoring kids and playing basketball and stuff like that. And Damien was one of the kids and he was 13. I was 28. And, you know, two years later, he ended up um, homeless because his parents were, his mom was a drug dealer. My dad's a drug dealer. Mom was a prostitute. He was mixed race, uh, dad, black, mom, white. And, um, he asked me, can we be my dad? <laughs> Actually, he said first, can I move in with you? Because he'd moved into a group youth home. And I said, you know what? Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's have you move in. But this, you know, you're, let's see what, how it goes. And basically that was the sojourn of my relationship with this young inner city kid who had really never had any parental support. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, for me, it meant a lot because it took me back to my high school years where I saw some of the smartest people in my high school uh, were people who grew up in the most terrible situations. And they were the people who were this, just the brilliant ones in 10th grade, but by 12th grade, they were pregnant or they were in jail or um, they were trying to you know, go to a great college as a star running back and they you know, messed their knee up, whatever. And <clears throat> so helping Damien was my way of just sort of giving back. It became a big part of my life. And um, he ended up having uh, two sons and a daughter and I, they became my grandkids. And, but he had, he had a situation that happened uh, a few years later um, uh, that was just tragic in terms of a, a, a really mistaken situation with the law. Uh, he'd never had any problems with the law at all. And, uh, and then I had to basically try to solve it for him at, when I was at the bottom of my depression. And do you guys still speak? Mm, gosh, we have not spoken for the last three years. Three, he, um, he lives uh, in a home that I've bought for him. So he, he, he basically went to prison wrongfully. He ended up in San Quentin prison after three years of us appealing and appealing and appealing it. And then he was there for seven, eight months in San Quentin. And then a federal judge let him out and said, this man is not supposed to be in prison. And he's not, he is not guilty. He's not, he's, he is, he, his constitutional rights in the case. Uh, he, he was basically brought up on a case that had never gone to court had never gone to trial because it was a new case. Um, and so the, and the, and the judge gave the wrong jury instructions and, um, she just didn't know there's a flaw. It was, it was not her fault. There was a flaw in the jury instructions. Um, so Damien was not guilty of four things. And the only thing he was guilty of was something that had a flaw in it. And so unfortunately he ended up coming out of San Quentin, a changed man. And part of the reason that I'm not in his life anymore is because on many levels, he came out an extremely angry man. And, uh, and, you know, I, I won't say anything more than that because just, uh, just out of fairness and confidentiality to him. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, it was a, a real rough ride after that, and um, including suicide attempts, et cetera. What did he teach you in totality from the moment you met him until where we are today? What, in other words, like, why was he in your life? What was the lesson you personally needed to learn? Mm. God, that's a shoot. This is good. You know, I think a couple of things. Um, so he taught me loyalty. He's an exceptionally loyal person. He's lo he was loyal to me. Um, he's loyal to his, his girlfriend, longtime girlfriend and his kids. Loyal to his employer, who is Kaiser. He's just a loyal person. And I appreciated that loyalty. It was a, it's, it was a, a breath of fresh air, especially in a world where, you know, especially for young, a younger person like him, Sometimes it's like, you know, hey, like I'll be loyal to whoever's given me whatever. Um, so I appreciated that. And yet where it became problematic is his expectation. I was loyal to him. I mirrored that loyalty until it didn't feel safe anymore. Mm -hmm. And until I won't go into a lot of details, yeah. but what I will say is that my loyalty, all of my friends and my family had to almost do an intervention with me to say, you are, you are being too loyal here. You are going way too far. And um, so the loyalty was a gift until it was a curse. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and that's true of some, a lot of things in life, you know? And so I would just say, um, I still love him. I, you know, I just, I, I think the world of him, his oldest son, I'm still very close with. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, his son, his next oldest son, uh, in the midst of all of this, just chaos, uh, committed suicide. Um, around, around the same time, Damien was trying to commit suicide as well. So pretty, pretty tragic situation. Um, and, um, but I, I'm proud of myself and, and my friends are just, you know, sort of shocked at how dedicated I was to him. I now, you know, have a, a couple of biological sons and um, that is, you know, who are nine and six. And, and that has really, really shifted my, you know, sense of like, okay, how do you bring kids up well? Because, you know, I, I end up, ended up in Damien's life when he was 13 and he had already had, you know, way, way, way too much damage, um, you know, from his parents. Uh, but he was really holding it together really well until, until it fell I apart. I think the experts say you got until about six or seven years old. After yeah. six or seven years old, you know, if there is significant damage, it's, it's pretty significant. So yeah. you alluded um, to earlier that, uh, that there was a little company called Airbnb who came knocking on your door. And yeah. take me back to like, I, I, I'm, I'm curious to know what that looks like. So th does the phone ring and does somebody say, hey, Chip, I got this company called Airbnb and we want like, <laughs> like, how does how does that happen? Yeah. So, well, first of all, it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't sold my company. Right. <clears throat> because I wasn't available. Um, but here I was. My, uh, my home was 12, uh, 12 blocks from Airbnb's headquarters at that time. The company was a small tech company that was at that point going global and, and, and growing fast. Yep. Nobody in the company had a hospitality <clears throat> or leadership or travel background. So I get a call from Brian Chesky who says, Chip, we would like to have you help us uh, democratize hospitality. Uh, those were his democratize hospitality. I was like, okay, tell me more about that. He told me about Airbnb. I didn't know much about them. This was more, you know, this was eight years ago, uh, more than eight years ago. And, um, but I was curious about it. And so we spent uh, an afternoon together and then he asked me to give a speech to his, his team, uh, his, the whole company basically. And I did. And he said, then he just said, listen, we got to get you in here. Um, so I, and I spent a lot of time with his co-founders. There's three of them, uh, Joe and Nate as well. And what became clear to me was they were onto something, but they just didn't know how big it could be. Um, you know, it's interesting when they first started, they first started, the reason it's called Airbnb is because they pulled out air mattresses. There was a big design convention in town. <clears throat> they were trying to pay their rent and they had three air mattresses in a living room in the South of market part of San Francisco. And, and so air bed and breakfast was about air mattresses on the floor. And then they grew and grew but the reality is when I joined them, they were not anywhere close to being a mainstream hospitality brand. And so I, my, part of my role was to help them see and help lead the company in a direction that would allow us to become a mainstream hospitality brand. Uh, so it was a fascinating journey because I was, I, and I still do, mentoring Brian Chesky, who is 21 years younger than me, and he was my boss. So I, I wasn't there to become the shadow CEO or to replace him. I was there to make him as successful as possible. But I also reported to him while also mentoring him, which was a fascinating mixture. Yeah. Um, yeah at the end of the day, we mutually mentored each other. We learned a lot from each other. And it's been a fascinating journey to see the company get to finally an IPO and then to have it do as well as it's been doing. Are you still there or is that no longer on your? Four years, four years full time. And then four years now as a strategic advisor. So I'm still there in the sense that I'm a strategic advisor, but I, but I was four years full time from 2013 to 2017. So how does that work? Is that like a contract where they say, hey, we want to bring you on for eight years, do four like this, four like that, or is it, we'll see how it goes. How does <laughs> no. that work? It was definitely not that good. Yeah, let me get into the specifics because I don't usually talk about this, but I, I'm enjoying this, uh, you know, you, and I, hopefully your audience will like it. So in the spring of 2000 or winter of 2013, um, I spent some time with Brian. In the spring, 
I'm now joining. And I say, I'll do 15 hours a week. And he says, okay. And then, and I say, you don't have to pay me. Don't pay me. Just give me 10,000 shares of stock that actually vest in six months. Okay. And that's it. And, and the shares of stock weren't worth, worth, worth a lot of money then. Um, so it's like, I wasn't getting paid a lot. I was more like saying, let's test this out. Let's test drive this together. We'll to see how, yeah. To, to see how it feels because, and we didn't want to be public about it because if the media saw that Chip, a CEO of his own hospitality company for 24 years, is joining these guys, I, there was going to be a sense that they could try to put a rift between me and Brian or talk about Chip's in there to like help run the company. And what it allowed us to do was have enough time together to see, do I want to stay? And does Brian want me to stay? And to build enough of a close relationship so that nobody could get in between us. Uh, and so long story short is um, I worked for free uh, for the first month or two. And then this was not 15 hours <laughs> a, a week. This was 70 hours a week. And that's when I said to Brian, listen, I'm not going to work for free anymore. And 10,000 shares of stock is not enough. And we I renegotiated things. And that's when I basically took on seven other parts of the business too. I, I became head of global hospitality and strategy in charge of business development, business travel, landlord partnerships, um, all, all learning and development in the company, et cetera. So it was a very expansive role, um, but it allowed me to have my finger on the pulse. And I was traveling all the time because we were becoming a global company. So I was traveling, frankly, for a while there more than anybody in the company. It's fascinating. You know, I just did um, uh, a, uh, a little sabbatical. I did four months in uh, Florence, uh, Italy. Mm. It was a, sort of a bucket list. And I stayed in an Airbnb and upstairs there was another Airbnb in this building and there was a rooftop and they did nightly Airbnb yoga experiences <laughs> overlooking the Duomo in yes. the center of Florence. And I didn't even know Airbnb had done experiences. experiences right. So this thing has gotten crazy. Now um, I'll get off Airbnb in uh, one second. How has this sort of pandemic, which there's nobody can predict this like ever, but right. how has this affected something like an Airbnb and what could you ever do to position yourself against it? Well, here's the thing that's interesting. So I still own some hotels. Um, I, I had 20, I now have nine. So I've sold 11. Um, so I've seen it from both sides. I've seen how is it, actually I've seen it from three sides of hotels and, and hotels have, have really struggled unless you are a hotel in a, um, in an air, like in, in nature, a, a hotel, you know, out far away from a city. Um, those hotels have done pretty well. Um, I've seen it from Airbnb's perspective and the first two or three months of the pandemic, Airbnb had to, you know, cut 25% of staff, get rid of all consultants associated with the company. Um, and where they had to, you know, take in $2 billion in, in loans just to sort of keep the doors open. With a B or an M? Uh, a B, $2 billion. A B. Wow. wow. Yeah. But here's what happened. Airbnb, so uh, bricks and mortar hotels uh, have, a, have a hard time adapting. Airbnb was able to adapt and because it's a platform, it's a marketplace. The marketplace shifted. So instead of actually Airbnb's prime business being cities in terms of people going to visit the city, um, the prime business became suburbs or rural areas. Um, in the U.S., it hugely grew the business because people from the U.S. had planned to take a summer vacation to mm. somewhere else, and instead they were deciding to stay domestic. Um, it, it meant a lot of people actually were doing becoming digital nomads and weren't just going to do a vacation. They were saying, to hell with living in that tiny studio in San Francisco for $4,000 a month. I'm going to go live on a beach in Baja in Mexico, and I'm going to pay you know, a thousand a month for a three bedroom home that I'm sharing with two friends and I'm going to stay there for four months. And, and so this digital nomad going mainstream uh, idea was perfectly suited to Airbnb. Also, people didn't want to stay in a hotel because they're worried about being in elevators or, you know, the housekeeping staff, whereas Airbnb gave you the autonomy. And so at the end of the day, Airbnb won that game. Um, relative to hotels. So, and when Airbnb was going to go uh, public, which happened in early December, uh, 
of, t- of 2020, um, I think everybody was shocked at what year that, that company had had because um, we had gone from being a company that almost looked like it might have to go out of business to having a very strong summer, uh, way stronger, and then being able to prove to the marketplace that we were adaptable, prove to the marketplace that there was exceptional loyalty in the community because 91% of Airbnb's business is either direct or organic, um, which basically means Airbnb is not reliant on Google, isn't reliant upon Mm. other kinds of intermediaries to get their business and people stayed loyal to the brand. And that was really interesting. Um, All that led to Airbnb, you know, coming out with a $68 per share price in, uh, on December 10th, which was, damn, like it was supposed to be come out at like 40 or 50 came out at 68. And today the price is somewhere around 180, 175. Um, Did you hold on? Did you hold on to that stock? Oh, well, first of all, you know, I, I could sell 15% of my stock uh, in the first week, but I, I'm locked up for the, for the rest for, you know, another month or two. Um, so it's been good. I, I sort of wish I could sell some right now because actually it's, it's, it's at a high right now. I don't, I think it's going to come down a little bit. Um, the reality is anybody investing in any of these kind of companies should look at the long term. Yeah. In the long term, Airbnb is a great bet. It's fluctuations in terms of price. There are so many people in the marketplace right in the market right now investing in that. That's not my way of investing. And I would just say, you know, Warren Buffett's the smartest investor we know. He doesn't invest that way. Just so, buy and hold it. Yeah. In the long term, Airbnb is a great investment. Um, and uh, yes, I have done very well there. So here's the part that's interesting. So here's this guy. So I, so to go back for a second, I took a job out of Stanford Business School for two thousand dollars a month. That's how much in nineteen eighty four I got paid with my job. I got I had job offers that were going to pay me ten thousand dollars a month. I took two thousand because I wanted to work for an entrepreneur and become a real estate developer. Then I started my company. Two and a half years later, I my salary was two thousand dollars a month. So clearly, money is not that important to me. Then I sell my company twenty four years later. Not for two thousand dollars, thankfully, but not for a lot of money. Not and, and and so you could sort of look at a chip is really good at creating businesses. He's not very good at, at actually putting money on the table. And then I sold, you know, eleven hotels in the last ten years and made a fortune. And then it, with Airbnb, you know, add a bunch of zeros to my net worth, and you know, <laughs> there, that's what's happened there. So it's been a fascinating journey for a guy who didn't really care a ton about money to be in a place where all of my friends who care a lot about money look at me and say, oh my God, you're the guy who actually has the highest net worth by far of all of us. And you're the one who did care the least about it. All right. So you can't, we, we've, we've wrecked How old are you now? 50? I'm six. I just turned 60. Oh, you look great. Okay. So you're 60 Thank years you. old. Yeah. So, you know, look, w- what's the average lifespan? 78, 79, hopefully, hopefully you're going to go to 120, right? <laughs> At least, yeah, I'd say 98 or 100, I'd say. All right. So let, let's, let's give you another 40 more years. Y- you can't take the cash with you, right? And you got mm-hmm. a lot of it now. How do you want to, how do you see the pile of cash that you have now being spent other than, you know, making sure that there's a roof over your head and you've got, you know, a retirement fund and blah, blah, blah. But how do you see that being spent over the next 40 years? So um, there, are, there are a ton of nonprofit causes that I care about. You know, every uh, inner city youth issues, of course, you know, that sort of comes out with my Damien story, um, environmental issues. So these are some of the things that I actually give to. But the thing that actually is really my sense, gives me a sense of legacy and purpose was creating this modern elder academy, uh, the world's first midlife wisdom school, that's a social enterprise that, and, and now what I'm doing is taking all of this money and growing it. Um, I'll, t- I'll come back to this, but let me just say, I'll come back. I'll come back to the origin story of that. But let me just say, we are now creating these things called MEA regenerative communities, and we've just bought a 2,600 acre ranch outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is our first um, MEA regenerative community in the U.S. And what is a regenerative community? It is a place where you have a regenerative farm or ranching. Um, you have a an MEA uh, campus, a Modern Elder Academy campus. Um, helping teach people how to navigate midlife and later in their life. How do you how do you help someone become an elder? Not elderly, but just an elder. And I was an elder at Airbnb. They called me the modern elder, 
And that was because I was twice the age of the average employee there. Um, so how do you use your curiosity and your wisdom to make a difference in the workplace and to make a difference as an investor or as a mentor? And uh, so, that, so the, the actual MEA regenerative communities is a farm, a ranch, a, a, a campus for the MEA program, and then uh, homes. So it's, you know, because people buy into the lifestyle. Uh, and so <clears throat> that is one of, that's the, probably the primary place where I will be putting my money is into something that is a combination of, uh, it's basically a, a social enterprise, which means that it's not trying to be a nonprofit, but it is absolutely wedded to a collection of social impact things that we're doing that uh, help define its success. So we don't just look at our success as profits. So will you have, just to make sure I understand MEA, will you have houses that are on yeah. the property that people yeah. who are, um, I guess, I guess, what's the age bracket? 60, 70, 80? 54. So, so we've had a thousand alums, a thousand alums now come to Baja from age 30 to age 88. Um, and the average age is 54. Okay, and they're buying a piece of the property on. So, if you're coming for a workshop, you're just coming for a week, um, and you do the week long workshop, and and it's a and it's you know very well regarded workshop. Uh, right now, during COVID, we're doing something called sabbatical sessions. Minimum stay is two weeks long, um, and it's a little bit lighter programming, and everything's outdoor um, because in Baja it can be outdoor. Yeah. Uh, but the regenerative communities I'm talking about is is where we will actually have homes that people can buy or rent um, that are interwoven with the campus. So you got a farm, you got a campus, and then you got homes. And why would someone want to be in the homes? Because, uh, you know, they fall in love with the sort of lifestyle that we espouse, uh, which is very much about regeneration. Um, the three things that people tend to want at age 50 or later in their life is purpose, wellness, and community. And this comes from research from uh, Phil, Dr. Phil Pilzo at Stanford. So purpose, wellness, and community. And we have looked at how do we up the ante and provide regeneration on all three of those for people. And so people say, man, I want, I want to buy into that. I'd like to live in a place. Similar to 40 years ago, Mel Zuckerman created Canyon Ranch, uh, you know, and, and really basically broke the model and recreated the model for what a destination spa resort was going to be. He had housing around it because people wanted to actually buy into the lifestyle. What's the demographic of the person that's in the community? Are they retired? Are they wealthy? Are they what? Give me a snapshot of who's there. It's a real diverse group because um, we, as a social enterprise, over half of the people who come are on some form of scholarship we give them. So I help fund the scholarship fund. And we have a nonprofit called AGE, the Association of Growth and and um, education for basically midlifers who want to go back and learn something. So it's 25% people of color. It's 60% uh, women. Aver as I said, average age 54. We've had people from 24 countries come here to Baja to go through our programs. W wealth level is like we have everybody from a union plumber or a physical therapist to Blake McCoskey, who started Tom's Shoes and is quite famous as a, as a social entrepreneur to um, you know, investment bankers who retire at 45. So it, it, what we believe is that wisdom, it's a wisdom school. So it's helping people to understand how to, how to cultivate and harvest their wisdom uh, in midlife. And so we believe that wisdom is not taught, it's shared. So when you're in a cohort of 20 people and you're going deep with that group of people, the diversity of that group has a huge impact on the experience you're going to have that week. If you are surrounded by a bunch of people who are just like you, you may not learn as much. And frankly, you may be less willing to get vulnerable with a collection of people who are just like you. Interesting. Really interesting. Okay. So February 27th, you're starting MEA online. Yeah, that's correct. And what is that? So in COVID we had to do two major pivots. One was, what do we do with our campus? Um, and so that's when we went to something called sabbatical sessions, longer stays, average length of stay has been people, it's minimum of two weeks, but on average people are staying a month. Um, and then the other thing we uh, did was created a, an online program 
we're full of what we call digital intimacy, which takes us back to, <laughs> to how we started our conversation, intimacy, um, mm-hmm. s- sex. No, it's not digital sex. It is digital intimacy. You're in, instead of being like in a MOOC with a thousand people and a Zoom screen, instead what you have is you're in cohorts of eight. And so you really get to know the other seven people in your cohort. And every single week in the eight week program, you're doing a one-on-one with one of your cohort members. Um, and then you, on your own time, you watch the videos that we have, you read the materials we have. And then every other week, the whole group of two or 300 people come together for a th- two or three hour call. But most of the time you spend is either by yourself with a, one partner in your diet or with your cohort of seven other people. And it's all focused on how do you design a roadmap for the transitions you want in midlife and beyond. So same, same story, average age is about 54 of people who are actually doing this. Uh, we have people, mo- almost everybody's between 35 and 75 um, who's, who's doing the online program. We did a beta of it in the fall eight week program. 97% of the people like endorsed it in a big way which is really unusual for a digital program. I mean, digital online learning kind of stuff is like oh. only yeah. maybe 25% get to the, the finish line usually. Yeah. Yeah. But we had 97% uh, endorsement, which is really impressive. And it's needed. I mean, we are, we are living this way now. So we have to do a better job of creating really engaged and intimate opportunities for people to learn um, and to connect with each other. This is amazing. I, I think I'm going to need to do it because I'm squarely right in your crosshairs. I'm 54 years old, so I am. I, I am your. I am your demo. Um, and you're in great shape. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, as we wrap up, a couple of uh, questions uh, I want to ask you. But before I get to those, I want to ask you about Mexico. You're currently living in Mexico. Live here most of the time. Uh, an hour north of Cabo, and uh, right on a beach. Our our campus is five acres on the beach. And um, for people that are, you know, in this place right now where, because I get this question a lot and I don't really have a great answer, but, you know, they, uh, you know, our country is so divided, you know, we're pointing guns at each other. We've got Black Lives Matters. We've got riots. We're storming the Capitol. I mean, you get it, right? People are um, really aggressively looking to get out of the U.S. either until this calms down or looking for something different. Do you have any thoughts sort of on that as a topic and maybe even more specifically um, relocating perhaps to Mexico? Well, a couple of thoughts. Uh, yeah. Who would have guessed that people would say to me, you know, that was really a smart, safe thing to move to Mexico. Right, um, right. Because, you know, when I first moved here four, four or five years ago, people were like, oh, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, so it's, it is very safe. We're, we're in an area called Pescadero, um, which is next to Todos Santos. It's, it's a rural fishing farming community. Lots of arts and culture here. It's spectacularly beautiful and it's safe. So I think, and it's, you know, one third the cost of living in the U.S. So yes, you can, you, your dollar goes for farther here. It's a safe place. It's a beautiful place. You're outdoors a lot, which is nice during COVID. Um, so for all those reasons, I think it's interesting. And the medical system here is not bad. You know, you, I, if I was going to have open heart surgery, I go back to San Francisco, but man, I've had it. We've had it. Well, we have a thousand people who've come here. We've had some situations where people got hurt or something like that. It's the medical system in Mexico is not bad. A lot of the, a lot of the people who are, especially in Cabo, which is so close to California, um, a lot of the doctors were, you know, trained in, in, in the U S mostly in California. So that's that. Um, I think that the, what we've seen is we have a community here called Baja Sage, which is a, a regenerative community here. It was a test. So we have the MEA campus and then a mile away, we have this t- 26 homes in a regenerative community that we are just about to break ground on. We've sold 17 or 18 of those even before we've broken ground because there are a lot of people from the US, all from the US or Canada. Uh, there are a lot of people, actually one from the UK. Um, but everybody else from U- U.S. or Canada. And it's people who are just saying, you know, I just, I, I want to get out. Yeah. And mostly U.S. I mean, it's like, it, it's, I think there's one or two Canada, one U.K., and then the other 15 are, are all, all U.S. And yeah, for all the reasons you say. Um, it's a, the other thing that's interesting about being down here is nature becomes your teacher. You know, it just, 
you, if you really want to look at nature and appreciate nature, you've got a lot of nature here. Farmland, desert, tropical, ocean, and mountains. All of that here, those five different kinds of topography um, just you know, within a walking distance of my home. Yeah, the area is incredible. I just did a, an event in Cabo and we went to Todos Santos for the day um, right across from the Hotel California. Mm -hmm. And um, we, uh, we got uh, the best Damiana margaritas we ever had in our life. It was, it was absolutely <laughs> incredible. I mean, it knocked me on my ass for three hours after that, but it was- Damiana is an aphrodisiac, my friend. Yeah, I know. I, I don't need any more fertility. Let me tell you that. Um, and then we did, uh, we went to, to a restaurant you may or may not know called Hasa Mango. And it yeah. was, uh, it was just amazing. It was, it was amazing. I mean, I, well, the I, thing that's interesting about this area, uh, Todos Santos and Pescadero and Cerritos, this is, it's a surfing area. It's got a lot of things around, but the number one thing, surfing, yoga, spirituality, art, but the thing that's common is food. This is a food culture. I, you know, I was in San Francisco for 38 years. That was a 36 years. I was, that was a food culture. This is a food culture. And because we have a lot of farmland and fishing here, it, there's a lot of a lot of good raw ingredients. I love it. All right. So as we wrap up here, I'm going to take you um, sort of a, a quasi speed round for time here because I could talk to you for hours. Um, what is on your nightstand? Mm, let's see what I have right right now on my nightstand is Victor Frankl's "Yes to Life in Spite of Everything." So Victor Frankl uh, famously wrote "Man's Search for Meaning," and this is uh, recently recovered. Um, uh, speech notes from speeches he gave in 1946 after he got out of concentration camp, uh, con his con concentration camp. So it's a, it's, it's a pretty bleak, but fascinating look at how do you create meaning when you're living in a prison and in the, or in this case, a concentration camp, which is a lot worse than a prison. So that's why I, I also just read cast C A S T E by Isabel Wilkerson, fascinating book about race relations and race, uh, in the u.s what do people often get wrong about you uh they got because i come across as a pretty kickback so southern california by birth that uh i'm not i'm not intense and i'm totally intense i'm like very competitive very intense um people in my company who join think oh chips just are like warm and fuzzy and i am i'm a nice guy and yet I fucking, excuse me, I just like plow through things. I get shit done. I, I expect a lot of myself. And so the closer you are in the organization, the more you're going to feel that. Not because I necessarily kick your butt, but because you see me as the role model to try to keep up with. And it's hard to keep up with me. Love that. Um, what is the thing that you do that's hard as shit, but it's totally worth it? You know, I, for the longest time, it was yoga. And let me just say, I love meditating. I hated yoga. It's sort of a weird thing. Most people like, you know, they like, the, they like both of them or they don't like both of them. No, I hated yoga. I, I love meditating. And uh, so yoga is hard as shit for me because I'm just, I am quite, uh, I'm quite stiff. I mean, like my, my, my hamstrings are like, <laughs> like, what is going on here? And as you get older, you get even stiffer. Like, oh my God. But, and, and for the longest time, I had a hard time doing yoga because I, I hate looking stupid in front of other people. And yeah. so in a yoga class, you feel that way, especially with a bunch of women who could just like put both legs behind their head. Yeah, I know. So I started just doing one-on-one. -on -one. We have a mindfulness teacher, uh, fa famous skateboarder and surfer, uh, Teddy Dean, who's on our MEA staff. And I just started doing one-on-one -on -one yoga with him. And that was the key. That was the key uh... to the walk. Because when I was doing one-on-one -on -one yoga, I wasn't judging myself. I didn't care about what anybody's, no one would see me. I do it up on the third floor terrace of my home with him. And, and so it's hard, it's hard, but I love it because it does help to that intense, you know, driven chip sometimes just needs a little yoga to uh, allow my body to open up a little bit. Well, it's actually perfectly aligned for you because it's the mix of intensity and relaxing simultaneously, yeah, which is not exactly. so easy. That's right. Um, <clears throat> I just, by the way, as an aside, I just finished a four-day TM uh, mm. training. Um, have you ever done that? Uh, I, that's what I do. It's freaking amazing. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> holy shit, life 
changing. I've been using the Calm app and the Headspace app. Forget it. Go do TM yeah. for four days. Yeah. You'll get. It. You'll lock it in. Yeah. Super incredible. Um, what's one rule that you have for yourself that you'll never break? Um, I'd say the re. <laughs> this is a silly rule, but reading before going to bed. Um, it, like it, it, for me, it, it's the way I clear my head, even if I'm drunk. You know, like, <laughs> like, like uh, I, I will read before going to bed because there's it's it's just sort of a it's like like a, like a ritual, and it's also the way to remove me from what I did that day. By the way, that's going to be my poll quote for for Chip. It's going to be <laughs> I read before bed, even if I'm drunk. <laughs> <laughs> what's an what's an unusual or absurd thing? that you love like somebody would look at it and go well that's weird mm. i would say it's absurd that i am willing to bathe in chocolate um so i have have, have I, or have have or have have, have. <laughs> I, I i have and i'm willing and maybe this is just maybe this is the curious white boy who wants to be a dark darker skin person with a book. i don't know but i can say that I love chocolate and I once had the opportunity to do a, a chocolate bath and then a, a chocolate massage. And I felt like I was going to have an orgasm. Well, so, I hope it's, I hope it was a couple's thing because what a yeah, waste. Yeah, it's just, so it's like, you know, they call me chocolate chip for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to do a speed round in the remaining uh, two minutes we have. What would your friends say is one of your superpowers? Uh, social alchemy. What keeps you up at night? Uh, my sons, like how they're doing. Do you collect anything or have you ever collected anything? I, I collect experiences at festivals. Oh, that's good. What do people never ask you, but you wish they did? Uh, what's been your biggest mistake in your life and what did you learn? Mm. What's the one thing you want to get better at? Uh, learning Spanish. What's your guilty pleasure? <laughs> Beyond chocolate. Um, my guilty pleasure is uh, a, a margarita, you know, a little bit before 5 p.m. <laughs> because it's five o'clock somewhere. Yeah. Uh, last question. We're going to change things up a bit. What one question would you like to ask me? Uh, how'd you get such cool hair? It's uh, it. Listen, it's a lot of products. It's it? uh, it's ex no, it's not. I, you know I, that th there's two questions I get asked a lot. One is the voice, and the other one is the uh, the hair. The hell do I know? I have okay. No then let's give another one. So of all of those ten photos you have behind you, which yeah. is the one you're most proud of? Most proud of. That's a great one. Um, well, I'm gonna have to. I'm going to have to split the question if it's okay, because okay. the first one I'm most proud of is this one right here. I was a chiropractor. I lived, uh, I was a chiropractor. I lived in Atlanta mm -hmm. um, for 25 years and I've always dreamed of living in Southern California and uh, I sold the practice and we finally made it last year. We moved to Hermosa beach Mm. Um, and this is, this represents me with my daughter. Um, I'm 55 with a six year old, 54 with a six year old. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, this represents that the second one would probably be this one. And this one is, um, in, uh, the South of France. We, uh, I did my second, um, work hard, play hard retreat, where I brought a group of 20 entrepreneurs and I created experiences for them where, you know, they landed in Nice and I had helicopters waiting for them and brought them into Monaco. Um, the next day I had a vintage car set up where we went through the mm. French Riviera. The following day I had speed boats and we went to Saint-Tropez and partied for the day. But I had been dreaming of creating that business to do something so much more than just fixing back pain. Sort of a lot of the things that we talked about in the beginning of this, where, yeah. you know, I knew that, you know, at one point that was my calling, but then it wasn't any longer. Yeah. So that those pictures represent the culmination of it.
Love Chip, it. This was a freaking blast. I am so grateful. Um, you're a big shot. And uh, you. when I mentioned that you're going to be on the show, I got a million messages from people. Oh, my God, that's a great get, as they say in the business. So I am so grateful that you agreed to do this. Um, any final um, questions or an ask or anything that I can help you out with? No, I mean, I think if, if people want to learn more about the Modern Elder Academy, it's just modernelderacademy.com and I've got a website chipconley.com and a blog uh, a daily blog called Wisdom Well and you can find the Wisdom Well daily blog on the Modern Elder Academy website have you thought about a podcast you know I, I mean leave that one up to you uh, okay. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> my daily blog is enough so. right. fair enough right. buddy thank you again great to see you thanks thanks 